Hello and welcome to Online Church Today. We are so glad that you have taken this Easter Sunday to spend with us as we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It is true that today looks much the same as Easter did last year. And yes, we're not able to do the things that we would normally be able to do as a family when we gather together, but that doesn't change our ability to celebrate what Jesus has done and the sacrifice that he made. And that's why we're here today. Kids, I want you to head to the website and make sure you download the kids activity that's available there for you so that you can follow along with what Pastor Daryl is speaking about later. But before we head into worship, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I am just so immensely grateful for all that you have done for us. Lord, this past year has been challenging for so many in so many different ways, Lord, whether it's because of job insecurity, Lord, or because of loved ones that have been sick, um, or perhaps we've even lost loved ones. Lord, it's been a really tough year, and yet we know that you are a good God. We know that you are sovereign. And Lord, we know that you love us, and you love us so much that you gave us your son. And today we want to celebrate that. We want to celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus willingly made on the cross for us so that we could have eternally, eternity with you. So Father, as we go into our worship today, Lord, may your spirit remind us of what this day is all about and why we celebrate today. Lord, may our worship be a sweet aroma to your throne room. And Father, as we go forward and leave this holiday behind, Lord, may every day we remember the sacrifice that you so willingly made because of your great love for us. I thank you for all that you are about to do. I pray that as we listen to uh, Pastor Darrell's message later on, Lord, that our ears will be opened, that our hearts will be changed, and Father, that we will see the love of Christ in all that he has done for us. We ask this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's head into worship. the power of sin and darkness, who love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory.
Good morning and happy Easter. We are glad you've been able to join us for this Easter Sunday. Before we hear from Pastor Daryl, there are a few announcements we'd like to cover. First, our community care campaign has been running for two weeks now. Our goal is to raise $1,100 so that we can bless every single staff and volunteer worker in our four local long-term care and hospice homes with a $2 Tim Hortons gift card. So far, we've received $400. Now, if Pastor Susan has done her math right, which is, you know, it's questionable, okay? Questionable. That means we still need an additional $700 to reach our goal. Let's show the love of Jesus to every single care worker at Simcoe Manor, the Good Samaritan, Riverwood, and Matthew's house. And don't forget that our prayer meetings have moved back to the building, which is very exciting. Please register online using the same link that you use for the Sunday service. We hope that you can join us every single Wednesday at 7 p.m. for an hour of prayer. And as a bit of a reminder, it has been great that we can be together in person each week and we appreciate every single person who registers. For some reason, if you realize that you'll not be able to attend and you have registered in advance, please be sure to call, so not email, but call the office and let us know. You can leave a message on Pastor Susan's voicemail if someone uh, does not answer so that we can free up space for others who would like to attend in person. So thanks so much for your help with that. Now let's hear from Pastor Darrell. Well, thank you for joining us online today, a very special Resurrection Sunday. Today, I want to share with you a message called Hope is Alive. Imagine with me for a moment that first Easter weekend, a Friday to a Sunday, somewhere between the years A.D. 30 and A.D. 36. The disciples not just losing Jesus to the mob of people and to the guards, but they lost their leader, their rabbi, their anchor, their friend. They also would watch Jesus go through the criminal trials before Herod and Pilate, watching him get beaten and bruised and found guilty of mistruth and then ultimately crucified on a cross. Imagine with me the defeat in the disciples, their purpose, their mission, their hope. The large group of followers, the intense discouragement, the self-inspection to their own actions of abandonment towards Christ on the day he needed them most. They must have been so heavy with guilt. Imagine with me the deep agony of Jesus' mother as she watched her son Jesus not only get abandoned and convicted, but crucified to a horrible death right before her eyes. The words crucify him became something of common terminology for the mobs of people who accused Jesus of blasphemy by his proclamation of being the Son of God. Great unrest, overwhelming stress, intense weight and pressure, the unknown, the uncertainty, the what are we going to do now? The scripture tells us in John 19, 38, that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus take Jesus' body and place him in a tomb, a stone placed in front to seal the tomb, and Roman guards placed out front to protect the tomb as an attempt to crush any rumor of, of Christ's disciples stealing the body to create some sort of false resurrection. What a hopeless scene for every believer of Christ during that time. 
I have to wonder what the cultural and political temperatures were like after Jesus died. I have to wonder if the people were truly satisfied or, or did they have epiphany moments like that of the Roman centurion after Jesus' death where he cried out in Matthew 27, 54, surely he was the Son of God. I wonder where there are those moments taking place. His death on the cross, a picture perhaps of hopelessness and defeat, already had brought transformation to a Roman guard. But thankfully, the story did not end with Jesus uh, dying. In fact, the story was just beginning. That was the picture on Friday, but Sunday looked so much different. Hope was alive. Hope is alive. So let's read from our text from Mark 16, verse 1 through 8. Here's what it says. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So this is now the third day after Jesus' death. He has been in the tomb since Friday and, and I'm sure there was deep pain of loss and emptiness on all the people directly involved in Jesus' life. Here we have Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and, and Salome making their way to the tomb very early Sunday morning to bring spices to anoint Jesus' body. And just to me, let me give you a little bit of context here. Saturday would have been their Sabbath day, so these ladies would have waited until after 6 p.m. on Saturday evening to purchase the spices. This would have been their law. So, so they would have followed all cultural law as well as, as, as any biblical laws that were before them, being careful to follow all the religious practices expected of them. Nothing was done out of place or against the laws of the land. And what I love about this part of the story is this. They went as soon as they were allowed to go. First light on Sunday morning with their newly purchased spices to anoint their rabbi. You see, every opportunity we get to be with Jesus is special, isn't it? Now remember, they are going to the tomb with heavy, grieving hearts. A tremendous loss in, in each of their, uh, of their lives. We know that, the, that this is a journey in its purest form. And what I mean is this. This was not about a scheme to steal his body, nor was this part of some plan the disciples were being accused of, creating to prove Jesus was, would rise again. These women followed all of the rules, and we know this to be true because their biggest question was, was this in verse 3. Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? They had not thought that far into their plan to anoint Jesus. So, based on that question, it was out of love and, and deep allegiance that they were going to see Jesus. Now, 
an important point to remember here. These women would have been witness to Jesus' death on the cross, and they would have been witness to Jesus' burial. This, this entire scene, they would have seen with their own uh, eyes up close and personal. Luke 23, 55 tells us this, The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. So this is an eyewitness account of Jesus' death and his burial. This is the context to which they are going to the tomb to anoint Jesus. So all of this was extremely emotional. Up close, it was personal. But isn't everything about Jesus up close and personal? Every part of his life and his death had significant impact. It still has significant impact. It was for a greater purpose. And these women, along with many, many others, had a transformation within their hearts because of Jesus. And so as they approached the tomb, anxious, upset, defeated, they noticed the stone that sealed the tomb had been moved. So you can imagine the shock, the wonder, the perplexity of the moment. I mean, let's think about it. I mean, they would have completely understood that picture of the stone in the tomb, but the stone itself, think about this, the stone itself would have been a very large cylindrical in shape type of a stone, likely weighing uh, uh, 2,000 to 4,000 pounds. And it would have been sandwiched between the tomb and a stone wall uh, with a slight incline, make it, making it impossible for Jesus, well, maybe not for Jesus, but making it impossible for any man uh, inside the tomb to move the stone and extremely difficult for several men to move it on the outside due to the incline and the groove that the stone sat in. So to see the stone moved, I mean, think about that for a moment. These three ladies going to the tomb when they saw the stone was moved, I'm sure it created more uncertainty. And perhaps for the first time since Jesus' trial, maybe even a what-if moment. What if he is alive? What if his words were true? What if moment in their lives? So, what is the purpose of the stone? Well, the obvious answer would be to seal the tomb and keep people out. That's the practical, sensible answer. They would seal the tomb as it was a grave for those that had passed away. They, they certainly sealed it and made sure it was done properly in this instance due to the conversation surrounding Jesus rising again. But in Jesus' case, the stone was not to keep Jesus in, but once it was rolled away, it was to show the world that he was not there. Can somebody say amen to that? So these women see that the stone had been rolled away, but not by human hands. They knew that was impossible. Their uncertainty quickly turned to fear as they saw a young man dressed in white sitting on the inside. This would have been an angel, by the way. Matthew 28 verse 2 tells us this. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down in he from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. So why did God send an angel? I mean, think about it. God could have just resurrected Christ without moving the stone. He could have done it without the use of an angel. See, God sent an angel as proof of the resurrection. 
He sent an angel to roll back the stone for the witnesses. He sent an angel to take care of the soldiers that were guarding the tomb. He sent an angel to provide comfort for the women. He sent an angel to validate the very resurrection of Jesus himself already filled with grief and despair, these women approaching the tomb with the stone out of the way without explanation would have caused more pain and grief. But see, God, even through the agonizing death of his son, provided care, he provided comfort, and what was needed at the moment, the angel provided the necessary information and the necessary care to prove that Jesus, our hope, is alive. Verse 6 in our text says this, Don't be alarmed, he said, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. And here it is. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. The angel provides comfort, provides explanation with detail, then ver verifies that Jesus is risen and asks the women to look where they laid him. And remember, that's important because they were there when they put him in the tomb in the first place. And so the angel verifies. See, this is where they put him. And, and, and he proves to them, he shows to them that he was gone. He was not there. Oh, can you imagine that scene, that moment? The emotion. Now, <clears throat> this resurrection story in Mark 16 takes a little turn in focus here. The angel calms the ladies down and, well, to the best of of his ability, I suppose, and then gives them this message in verse 7. But go, I want you to notice the words here. But go, tell his disciples, Jesus' disciples, and Peter. Interesting how, how Mark breaks that up. Go, tell his disciples and Peter. And this is the message. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. It's interesting to note that Peter was not likely with the other disciples at this time. Remember, Peter is probably filled with shame and he's filled with embarrassment and filled with guilt and filled with total emptiness. Even though he wept bitterly, uh, an act of repentance unto itself after he denied Christ, there still existed this disconnect. He was separated from the group. But again, you see, God sees all things. God knew that Peter needed a little personal word, a little pick-me-up, a little nudge, if you will. The angel says, be sure to tell Peter as well. Isn't that just like Jesus, though? In the middle of his death and resurrection, he still cares for personal needs. He still cares for our needs. This demonstrates to me God's compassion and God's perfect wisdom to provide what humanity needs. Peter needed to be reconciled to God, but also reconciled to the other disciples. Jesus' resurrection will not only provide redemption for all of humanity in the days, of he, uh, days ahead, but it also provided instant reconciliation between a group of people, the disciples, that would be instrumental in, in forwarding the gospel message. So let me ask you this today. Do you need redemption today? Do you need to reconcile with someone today? Do you need redemption? Do you need reconciliation in a relationship? And because of the resurrection of Jesus, we can have right relationship with God at this very moment, and we can mend relationships, reconciliations, uh, reconciliation with the people around us. 
We don't have to carry that weight of sin and awkwardness and, and uncertainty any longer. We don't have to live in guilt or shame or embarrassment. Jesus, through being our hope alive, has provided a way for us to be relieved of the weights of this world and to be personally in relationship with God. Oh, he's alive, church. Hope is alive. Ephesians 2.18 tells us this. For through him, talking about Jesus, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Because Jesus has risen, hope is alive. And we can have instant access to God the Father because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of Jesus rising on the third day. See, without the cross, there is no tomb. And without the tomb, there is no resurrection. And without the resurrection, there is no hope for humanity. But Jesus did die on the cross. He was buried in a tomb, but he has risen. As the angel told the three women, he is not here. Hope is alive. Now, Jesus had predicted his death. He had predicted his resurrection and the disciples and these three ladies never fully grasped what it was being said to them. The angel reminded them by telling them to relay this message in verse 7. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. There's the reminder again of what Jesus has predicted I have been recently thinking about our Christian walk in the context of belief. Many people require proof and even sometimes tangible proof that, that we are doing the right thing. Then I began to look at this powerful resurrection story and, and I attempted to put myself in their shoes the death, the burial, the resurrection, the angel, the messages, the, the appearance of Jesus later on. It must have been absolutely overwhelming. Then I came to somewhat of a conclusion. We don't have to have it all figured out. This is a walk of faith. We just need to believe the words of Jesus. Believe what he says to us is true. Hebrews 11.1, 1. now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. In other words, it is by faith through our belief in Jesus that we have a relationship with God. So we trust him. We trust that he knows what it is he's doing. And we don't have to have it all figured out. Now after the stone was rolled away, and they were given instructions. It wasn't really a moment of celebration. You'd think it would be. I mean, we, we look at it that way because we have the whole Bible to reference, but they didn't have it. They were living it. They were, they were fearful. It wasn't a moment of celebration. It was a moment of fear, perhaps. Fearful, trembling, the text tells us in verse 8. They were afraid that others were going to think they were crazy. They still feared the, the Jewish and the Roman authorities, all kinds of conspiracies around Jesus' death and his resurrection and destroying the temple in three days, etc. All of that was, was kind of going on. So they were living in fear of the authorities, thinking that they were somehow going to steal the body. So the ladies did as they were told telling no one except the disciples and Peter. And the key for us as we, we read this text and hear this message, the key for us today is this, believing the words of Jesus. See, he said he would die, check. 
He said he would be buried, check. He said he would rise again, check. He said he would come again, check, based on faith, based on the fact that God has never let us down and based on the fact that hope is alive. We check that one off too. And the question that surfaced for me through this passage is this, do we believe everything Jesus tells us? Do we believe everything that Jesus tells us? So jumping ahead a little bit, as I conclude today, we should believe everything Jesus tells us because Jesus has done everything he has promised up to this point. Everything he said he would do, he has done. But there is one final event that the church is still looking forward to, and that is his return. Acts 1.11 kind of captures it the best for me, at least. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? And note the words, this same Jesus who has been taken from you through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Because hope is alive, he is coming back. He is coming again. He is coming for you and for me. We look for his return because of his resurrection. His return would not be possible without his death. His return would not be possible without his resurrection. His return is still relevant and still real for this day, 2021. Hope is alive. Amen, church? Well, let's pray today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice that you paid for our redemption, for our freedom. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the tomb. But boy, we sure thank you for the resurrection. We thank you that you are alive. It solidifies everything about this Christian walk. It completes this journey of faith that every single one of us are on. It completes it. And Jesus, we thank you for that today. So Lord, we pray that you would give us Holy Spirit boldness to proclaim the good news of the gospel message to every person. Like the angel spoken to the three women's lives, the message they were to tell, I pray, Lord, that we would listen to your words and tell other people about the good news. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being alive and well. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us the strength that we need. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that hope is alive in this day that we live. And God, we pray all of these things in the wonderful and powerful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you and thank you for joining us online today. Hope is alive.